Cars, a copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Fresno County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Sensen all cars broadcast 145. Be on the lookout for James Kipp, described as an Indian. About 33 years, 5 feet 6 inches, 150 pounds. This man has been missing for eight days, and that's all. wild, mountainous regions of California, Arizona, and Nevada, the work of the city police is taken over by the county sheriffs and their deputies. Relentlessly, the never-ending manhunt goes on through the dark streets and alleys of the cities, through the dangerous mountain roads and the trackless desert, where desperadoes hide from the officers of the law. To ensure their victory in the chase, police and sheriff's forces use the finest gasoline they can buy. Isn't it significant that more of these police and emergency cars are powered by Rio Grande cracked gasoline than by any other brand? Everywhere it is sold, in city, mountains, or desert, Rio Grande cracked gasoline is preferred above all other brands by the police, fire, and emergency cars. Your law enforcement officials can't afford to risk gasoline troubles. It would be fatal to have starting trouble, to have a carbon-clogged engine, or a fouled spark plug during the chase of a fleeing criminal. Emergencies arise every day in the operation of police and sheriff's cars. Emergencies when every second counts and desperate drivers call upon their cars for every bit of speed and power possible. That's when Rio Grande cracked gasoline delivers the performance which has won its preference with the officials of so many cities and counties in the West. You can get the same police car performance in your own car by specifying the same gasoline emergency cars used Rio Grande Crack. And now it is our great pleasure to present Sheriff George Overholt of Fresno County. Sheriff Overholt. Good evening. There are two elements almost always found in murder cases. First, the killer's own conscience, and second, his desire to cover up his movements. And in a great many cases, it is one of these two things that traps him. In the story you will hear tonight, both of these elements were highly instrumental in bringing the original crime to light and eventually placing the murderer in our hands. Had the killer not made the mistake of trying to cover up certain bits of evidence that he thought were dangerous to him, it might have been months or even years before the crime was discovered and the chance of our locating the man who did it would have been pretty slim. However, as you will hear, his own fear of the law led him to make a mistake that in The end cost him his life on the gallows. On a hot summer evening in 1932, Al Fuller, postmaster of Seville in Tulare County, California, and his partner Jim Kipp, a one-legged Indian, are just closing up shop when Mrs. Fuller comes in. What a day. Oh, what a day. Yeah, it's been a scorcher, all right. It'll be just as hot all night. Al, how about driving me up into the hills away so I can get a breath of cool air? <laughs> Not me. I'm fagged out. It's a cold bottle of home brew in bed for me. Oh, please, honey. We wouldn't go far. I said no. Didn't you hear me? Yeah, I heard you. Jim? Yes, Edna? Will you drive up in the hills with me? Why, sure. I'd be glad to. Thanks, Jim. How soon will you be ready? Oh, in a few minutes. Uh, just as soon as I get these crates outside. Here, let me open the door for you. Oh, thanks, Edna. Al, you shouldn't let that poor boy do that heavy work. Look at him, pegging along on that crutch, trying to stack those heavy boxes. Afraid it'll tire him out too much for his ride up into the hills? Al, what do you mean? Do you think I'm blind? You think I don't know what's going on? That poor boy says you licking your lips. I'll be glad to go for a ride with you, says he, losing his breath. Think I'm going to let you get away with that? Oh, yeah, you're crazy. I've never been with Jim a minute that you haven't been there. And you're not going to start now. I ask you to take me out for a breath of air, you refuse. So you figured that gave you the right to go off with that dirty one-legged Indian, huh? Well, 
He's your partner and your friend. Yeah, he's still a wife-stealing Indian. I won't stand here and let you talk about him like that. Oh, you won't, eh? And what are you going to do to stop me, you tramp? <laughs> That's just a sample. Let me see you making eyes at that red skin and I'll break every bone in your body. <laughs> Edna, are you? Why, Edna, what's the matter? Al, hit me again. He accused you and me of... Why? Why the... No, Jim. Don't do anything about it. If that's what he thinks, let him think it. He's hit me for the last time. What do you mean? I'm leaving, Jim. Where are you going? I don't know. Up to Fresno, I guess. I earned my living before I met Al. I can sling hash again. Oh. <laughs> I'll miss you, Edna. You've been mighty nice to me. He doesn't understand that. He doesn't know that a man and a woman can be just friends. Jim, Jim, I want you to forget about this. You and him are partners. You've got all your money invested in this place with him. Just forget about what he said and go on like nothing had happened at all. Will you promise me that? He ought to have his eyes black for talking about you like that. Yeah, but people like him don't get their eyes black. They get by with the stuff they pull. Yes. At least they don't get their eyes blacked by Indians with one leg. He'll get what's coming to him someday. You just wait and see. Edna moves to Fresno. And Jim, on his frequent trips to town, never fails to drop in for a friendly chat. Then one day, not Jim, but Al drops in. Hello, sugar. Al, what do you want? What's the matter? Ain't you glad to see your husband? Sure, sure. But... I, uh, I want to apologize for what I did that night, honey. I'm sorry. It's all right, Al. I, I forgive you. Thanks, kid. I don't know. Maybe it was the heat or something that made me go wild that night. Well, I guess we might as well forget it, Al. How's everything down in Seville? Not so good, Edna. Door burned down the other night. Oh, Al, well, no. Yeah. I lost everything. But you had insurance. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do about the mail? I'm still handling it. Set up over at Pop Andrews temporarily. Going to get another place? I don't know. I suppose so. How's Jim taking it? All right. Say, Edna, how about taking a little ride with me? Where to? Oh, up the valley away. Well... All right. Come on. Wait till I get my hat. Oh, you don't need a hat. We'll only go as far as Madeira. All right, then. Let's go. Why, Al, this is Jim's car. Yeah. Was your car burned up in the fire? No, it's all right. I just borrowed Jim's car for today. Come on, hop in. Half an hour later, Al pulls into a garage in Madeira, parks the car at the back, opens the door for Edna. Come on, Edna. This is as far as we go. What do you mean? Give me a check for this car, will you, buddy? Yes, sir. How long will you be in? Overnight. Yes, sir. That'll be 35 cents. Oh. Here you are. Keep the change. Don't let anybody monkey around the car. Yes, sir. Thank you. What's the idea, Al? i got to get back to Fresno. i got to go to work in half an hour. I'll get you back if you'll stop the gab. How? By bus. There's one leaving in five minutes. But I don't understand. You don't have to. Come on. The next day, Al calls for Edna again, forces her to accompany him to Madeira, this time in his own car. When they arrive, he parks around the corner, and the two of them walk toward the garage. Oh, wait a minute, Al. you got to tell me what this is all about. Listen, you'll be better off if you keep your mouth shut. But where are you going now with Jim's car? We're going to drive it to Merced and leave it there tonight. How do we get back from Merced? We're going to take a stage back here and pick up my car and go on to Fresno. But why, Al? What are you moving Jim's car north for? Where's Jim? What's he say about this? Listen, sugar, do you want another bat over the kisser? Now, you're doing as I say. There's something funny about this. Well, it's none of your business. You're doing as I say. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do any dirty work for you. What do you mean, dirty work? I... Oh, no, you won't, Al. You lift a hand to me, and I'll have you put in jail this time. 
cocky, ain't you? Maybe. But if you think you can make me a party to anything as shady as this looks, you got another thing coming. Al, what have you done to Jim? Jim? I don't know anything about Jim. He walked out on me. That ain't true, Al. If he'd done that, he'd have told me so. Oh, he'd have told you, huh? You two are still at it, huh? I might have known it. Oh, you're disgusting. Wait a minute. Where are you going? Back to Fresno. You keep your mouth shut. You're not worth talking about. But Edna feels that Jim is worth talking about. After a sleepless night of weary, she takes her problem and her suspicion to the district attorney, tells him the story. So that's all I know about it, sir, but it doesn't sound right. Him moving Jim's car north by short jumps, and Jim never showing up for more than two weeks now. Well, what do you think he might have done to this Jim Kipp? I don't know, but Al's capable of doing anything low and mean. Why, he might have murdered him and thrown his... Yeah, that's it. What? Al was a partner with a fellow in a mine up near Raymond a couple of years ago. I was up there with him one day, and we were looking down an old mine shaft. Al dropped a rock down it, and after a long time, we heard it splash in the water in the bottom. And Al looked at me sort of funny-like and said, this would be a good place to do away with a person. Mm, you think this husband of yours would do such a thing? Of course he would. Well, we'll investigate the matter and try to locate Mr. Kipp. In the meantime, please don't mention this to anyone, especially to your husband if you see him. Don't worry, I... I won't. The district attorney asks the assistance of the sheriff of Tulare County in checking up the background of Al Fuller and the whereabouts of Jim Kipp. He requests the sheriff of Madera County to ascertain the truth of Edna's statement regarding the moving of the car. When the officers are ready to report, they meet in the office of Sheriff Overholt of Fresno County. I've asked you boys to meet me here in George's office so he can hear the result of your investigation. And if we have any proof that a crime has been committed, we can possibly discover in whose jurisdiction the case lies. Now, um, what did you find out, Sheriff Rhodes? The girl's story is straight enough. A man who answers the description you gave me of Fuller left a Ford sedan, license number 6D721 in the Western Garage last Tuesday. He was accompanied by a woman answering the description of Edna Fuller. He picked up the car the next day, but the woman had left him after some angry words before they went into the garage. I did a little checking up in Merced and found the garage where the car had been left on Wednesday night. Now, my hunch is that we can trace the car right on up to Oakland or San Francisco. He probably stopped Thursday at Modesto. Good. Uh, now, how about Tulare County? What did you find down there? Well, Kip hasn't been seen since the night before Fuller's store burned down. We haven't any evidence of arson, but... Here, look at this. What's that? The insurance papers on the store. Made out to both Kip and Fuller. Kip's signature is a forgery. Apparently executed by Fuller. Uh, here. Here's an example of Kip's true signature. I should say that's a better motive than Mrs. Fuller's more self-satisfying story of jealousy. No question about it. Ten thousand dollars worth of insurance. Well... You have a case of arson and forgery against Fuller in Tulare County. And you, Dusty, have a case of grand theft of the auto against him in Madeira County. Uh, we've got to find the body now and find out who has the murder case against him. George, I think as sheriff of Fresno County, you've got the problem of finding the body. Okay with me, but what have you to go on? Mrs. Fuller told me about a mine up near Raymond. What well, uh, Fuller was interested in, he remarked to her how easy it'd be to dispose of a body in one of the abandoned pipes up there. That's worth looking into. You bet it is. I suggest you get Mrs. Fuller to go along with you. Possibly she can find the place again. Okay, I'll get on it right away. Accompanied by Mrs. Overholt and under Sheriff Jack Tarr, Sheriff Overholt and Mrs. Fuller leave Fresno late in the afternoon. The sun has set by the time they reach Raymond, and it is dark when they arrive at the point which Mrs. Fuller believes is nearest the mine. The party leaves the car, and their way, lit by flashlights, scramble up the steep rise toward an abandoned mine, the gaunt machinery of which is starkly silhouetted against the star-spangled sky like a gibbet for the moon. I, I don't like this, Sheriff. I, I'm, I'm afraid. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of, Mrs. Fuller. You don't know Al Fuller. He's a killer. What makes you so sure of that? I got a good idea he killed a bank clerk in a hold-up back east somewhere. 
He was drunk one night and boasted about murdering a section hand in Macon, Georgia. He threatened me if I talked. Oh, I shouldn't have said anything about this. Now, listen to me, Mrs. Fuller. You've done exactly the right thing. Especially if this man has committed such crimes before. Well, I did it because of Jim Kipp. Now, please understand, Sheriff, there was never anything between us, but he needed sympathy and understanding. That's what I gave him. That's what he gave me. I understand. And now we're looking for his grave. And if we find it, you'll be looking for mine soon. Oh, Mrs. Fuller, be sensible. No, I know it. Al will kill me. I know he will. I... Well, what's the matter? Something just swished by me. Something like a ghost. I gotta get out of here. I can't stand it. I gotta well, get out of here. It's only a branch of a tree. Oh, fuck, the gym's gone. Oh, God, it never save me. Save me. Save me. Well, Jack, we can't get anything out of her tonight, that's sure. We'd better take her back to town, George. We know the general location of the place. We can come back here later and look for the body. All right. But I think the next step is to arrest Fuller. I'm more convinced than ever that we've got a murder case on our hands. The next day at a bootlegging joint in Fresno, Jack Tarr is talking to the bartender. Know a fellow by the name of Al Fuller, Pete? Sure. You been around lately? Yeah. He's out in the back room now, playing the slot machine. Thanks. I want to talk to him. Yeah. Tough luck, buddy. You'd have had a jackpot if that baby hadn't slipped a notch. Yeah, well, I'll knock it over this time. Yeah, what did I tell you, huh? Not quite a jackpot, but not bad. Yeah, I'll get it yet. I'm not so sure of that. What do you mean? This is one time you're going to walk out with your winnings. What the devil are you talking about? You're under arrest. What for? Suspicion of murder. <laughs> you got the wrong guy. So who are you looking for? Al Fuller. Well, you got the wrong guy, I tell you. I'm not Al Fuller. Well, you're a close enough information. Stick out your hands. With Fuller safely lodged in the county jail, Sheriff Overholt leads a posse over the hills near Raymond, searching for the body of Jim Kipp. Several days go by, and nothing is discovered. Finally, one day, when he returns discouraged to his office, the sheriff is met by Fuller's attorney. Now, look here, Sheriff. You've got to let my client loose. Why? Uh, you know why. You've got him charged with murder, and you haven't proven the corpus delecti. Yeah, you've got to have a case, and you know it. You can't keep a man in jail indefinitely like this. It just ain't constitutional. I'll get the corpus delecti. Yeah, and I'll get Fuller sprung. I'm going to file a suit for habeas corpus and make you let him go. And you can't do a thing to stop me. Go ahead. Do anything you like. But I'm going to send Fuller up for murder. Well, we'll just see about that. Good day. Why, he's right, though, Sheriff. Of course he's right. If we can't find that body, we can't keep Fuller in jail. But I'm morally certain that he's the murderer. So am I. But if that lawyer of his ever gets a habeas corpus, Fuller will beat the country. Listen, that wife of his has a convenient memory. She may have remembered some more things about that dear husband. Get her over here. I want to go to work on her. Mrs. Fuller, I'm afraid we've got to release your husband. Why? He's guilty. I know he is. I feel he is, too, Mrs. Fuller. But unfortunately, we have so far been unable to prove that a crime has been committed. So when his attorney obtains the necessary court order, we'll have to release him. Now, what I asked you to come over here for was to arrange for the necessary bodyguard for you. Bodyguard? For me? Well, what do you mean? Well, naturally, your husband knows that his arrest came about because you told the authorities your story. Now, I'm afraid once he's at liberty, he will attempt to get his revenge on you. And our job is to prevent crime as well as solve them. Oh, don't let him out, Sheriff. Please, for the love of heaven, don't. He'll kill me, bodyguard or no bodyguard. He'll kill me. I'm afraid we have no choice in the matter but to release him. Well, there's some way. Well, of course, if he'd committed a crime of any kind in Fresno for which we could hold him, it would be different. But apparently, the only thing we have on him is the suspicion of this murder. Oh, but he did commit other crimes. He held up Johnny Schroeder's pool hall. Oh, he did? Yeah, he did that job. He told me all about it. Why didn't you tell us that before? Why... I don't know. I didn't want to squeal on him too much. Sometimes it's the safest course, Mrs. Fuller. I I feel like an awful heel, Sheriff. Well, if you'll think how you've just saved your neck, that feeling will pass. Thank you very much, Mrs. Fuller. You're welcome. I'll call you when I want to talk to you again. Yes, sir. Pretty smart, Sheriff. Pretty smart. They never did have a suspect on that Schroeder holdup. Fuller will do beautifully. That was a city case. 
We'll lend our prisoner to the police department until we find that body. Hello? Chief? This is George Overholt. Listen, I've got a suspect on that Schroeder holdup. Yeah, Fuller. The same guy I've got in on suspicion of murder. Well, listen, will you make out a warrant for robbery against him and hold him as your prisoner for a while? Yeah, I'm beating a smart lawyer with a habeas corpus at his own game. Thanks. With Al Fuller safely and permanently jailed, awaiting trial for the Schroeder robbery, with Fresno police building a case against him on that crime, Sheriff Overholt and his posse renew their search for the corpus delicti of Fuller's greater crime. Then one day as the sheriff and Jack Tarr are climbing a hill back of Raymond, Certainly is a needle in the haystack job, Sheriff. These hills are pitted with old mine shafts. We could work out here for six months and never get any closer to a solution. You'd have to go down every one of these pipes to be sure a body had been thrown in them. Not every one, Jack. I have a hunch on this one. There's something down there. Let's take a look. I'll take a look. No. No, it's too deep to see anything. Yeah, might be a cow down there. Might be, but cows don't drive up to mine shafts in automobiles. What do you mean? Look at those tracks. The car came in here, stopped, then drove away. When it drove away, it drove fast. Look at the way it kicked up the dirt making this turn. Come on. Where are we going? Back to Raymond to get a hard rock miner and some tackle to go down this shaft. Back in Raymond, the sheriff enlists the professional assistance of an old prospector. And while he is assembling and loading his gear, Overholt and Tar drop into a beanery for a sandwich and a cup of coffee. Would you like some pie with the coffee, gentlemen? No, I don't think so. How about you, Jack? Yeah, I'll have a piece of apple pie. Apple pie coming up! Hey, buddy, we're looking for a guy. Yeah? Did you ever see a fellow like this picture come through here? Well, let me see, let me see. Hmm, yeah. Yeah, he had some chili in here one day. How long ago? Oh, uh, about... Two weeks ago. Yeah, I, I, I remember him because there was a one-legged guy with him. Yeah, one-legged guy. He looked like an Indian. Are you sure? Yeah, positive. This is too good to be true. What time of day was it, do you recall? I guess it was around 4.30 when they left, yeah. Funny thing, too, about 20 minutes later, I saw this guy on this picture come down the road like a bat out of Hades. Only he was alone. He didn't have the Indian with him. Well, I guess that cinches the deal, Jack. Come on, let's get back to that mine. <laughs> Working in the glare of automobile headlights, the miner, with the willing assistance of the deputy sheriffs, assembles the windlass, and with two men slowly paying out the line, starts the descent into the deep. I'm sure the answer, Jeff. I wouldn't want to. Me <laughs> oh, it's bad enough up here. Hey, you said it. It, sure it certainly is. is a deep shaft. Yeah, I can't see anything down there. What did you say? Hold it. I'm down the water. Hmm, I guess he's found it. You can hardly see his light down there. Must be 40 feet. Pretty dark down there. Hold me, hold away. He's found something. Hold it. What's the matter? A couple of more things you want. His cut in his hat. Hey, that was him. Okay, take it away. Easy, does it. Easy, does it. Easy, does it. Easy, does it. Sounds like it. Stand by to give him a hand when he gets to the surface, boys. Here he comes. All right, all right. Here he is. Swing him over. Take it easy, boys. Don't drop him. I don't want to have to go back down there again. Get him under the shoulders. Let's have a look at this. Take his hand. Hard to tell anything. I'm down there so long. But he's got only one leg. See if there's any identification in his pocket. Yeah, well. Draw the rope on the truck. He's the one on it. And then you put him in plenty again. Here are a couple of papers. Mm-hmm. Some bills made out to Jim Kipp. Well, boys, I guess we've got our corpus delicti all right. Oh, yes, Doctor, come in. I've just completed my autopsy on that body you brought in last night. Yes? Death was caused by drowning. By drowning? Exactly. The man was hit on the head by a sharp instrument which fractured his skull, but that didn't kill him. How do you know? His lungs were full of water. Then Fuller beat him over the head, knocked him unconscious, and then dumped him in the shaft, throwing his crutch and hat after him. Well, Jack. Yes, sir? Bring Fuller down here. I want to talk to him. Sit down, Fuller. What are you after me again for, Sheriff? I'm being held for the city cops. 
We found Jim Kipp's body last night, Fuller. His body? What happened to him? You murdered him. <laughs> oh, no, not me. You got the wrong guy. Fuller, you drove Jim Kipp up to Raymond. You had a bowl of chili at a lunchroom there. You left Raymond about 4.30. You drove that boy up to a mine shaft three miles out of town. You hit him over the head with a miner's pick and dumped his body in the shaft. That happened at 4.45, which was the time his watch stopped when he hit the water in the bottom of the shaft. Then you backed your car out of there fast and raced back down the road. You went through Raymond five minutes later at 50 miles an hour. Your motive in committing this crime was to get the complete insurance on your store, which you set fire to yourself the same night you murdered Kip. Well, have I made any mistakes so far, Fuller? It was him or me. What do you mean by that? He wanted me to go up there and look at a mine with him. When we got there, he said he was in love with Edna. And I had to get out. I said a couple of things to him, and he said he'd brought me up there to kill me. Then he drew his crutch back over his shoulder and started to swing at me with it. I picked up an old pick that was lying up there and tried to knock the crutch out of his hand. I, I hit him with a pick, and he went down, dead. Well, I, was, uh, I, I was scared. I, I didn't know what to do, so I dumped him in the shaft, crutch and hat, pick and all. Well, aside from the fact that he wasn't dead when he hit the water, there's another point I'd like to clear up. Just stand over there in the middle of the room, Fuller. Oh, no, away from the desk in the chairs. Oh, yeah? That's right. Now, what shoulder did he draw the crutch back over? His left. Are you sure of that? Yeah. And he swung it at you before you could defend yourself? Yeah, a couple of times. All right. Take this ruler, Fuller. Imagine it's a crutch. Now stand on your left leg. Uh, what's all this for? I just want to corroborate your story. Kip's right leg was missing, so stand on your left as he did. That's right. Now swing that ruler over your left shoulder and back toward me, just as he did. Go ahead. Oh, boy. <laughs> you see, Fuller, it would be quite impossible for a one-legged man to swing a crutch with murderous intent. He'd throw himself off balance and fall down, just as you did now. Oh, dirty rat. Al Fuller's weak story was blasted full of holes by the concerted efforts of the boys of my office and the sheriffs of Tulare and Madera counties. We brought him to trial and we won our case. The jury found him guilty and he sentenced him to hang in San Quentin prison. Thank you, Sheriff Overholt. Ladies and gentlemen, today a new issue of the Calling All Cars News is displayed everywhere Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. And in the next few days, a half million motorists will drive in to get a free copy of the news. Have you ever read this interesting publication of crime news, true detective stories, movie and radio news? You'll enjoy this latest issue, and we urge you to drive into the Rio Grande station in your neighborhood and ask for your free copy. If you have a boy or girl in your family, they'll be thrilled to read how easily they can get a junior detective outfit of 14 valuable articles, all free. As you drive in your car tomorrow, just notice the number of service stations featuring Rio Grande cracked gasoline. These are all independent stations, free to choose any gasoline or oil they wish to sell. And as proof of the greater value in the Rio Grande products, we point to our rapidly increasing army of independent dealers. Only by offering you better gasoline and better oil can the independent service station hope to win and hold your trade. And by featuring Sinclair Motor Oil, the independent dealer guarantees his customers against motor trouble from oil breakdown. Sinclair Motor Oils have won a worldwide reputation for quality. Every Rio Grande cracked gasoline dealer is qualified to tell you exactly what grade of Sinclair oil or lubricant is needed for every part of your car and to give you scientific lubrication according to your own car manufacturer's specifications. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night. Calling All Cars, a copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars, broadcast 146 regarding a missing person. Be on the lookout for Dale Slater, an American, age 20, has brown hair, light eyes. Occupation, carpenter's helper. This man has not been heard from since June 18th. That's all. Rosenquist.
police trail the killer on tonight's true crime story, clues lead them through California, Arizona, and Nevada. In these states, Rio Grande cracked gasoline speeds officers in their search, for throughout this area, more police, sheriffs, and emergency cars use this gasoline exclusively than any other brand. Manhunting is a serious business, and the high-powered cars operated by law enforcement officers must operate at peak efficiency. Rio Grande cracked gasoline has proved for years past that it develops more speed, more power, a greater all-around performance, and that's why so many cities and counties select this one brand year after year for their finest, fastest cars. Experience with all brands of gasoline has taught these big buyers that Rio Grande has advantages over all others. The patented cracking process by which Rio Grande Cracked is made is so different from other gasolines that it can be imitated but not duplicated. Today, as for years past, Rio Grande Cracked wins all tests to discover a faster starting, a speedier, and a more powerful gasoline. When you get gasoline tomorrow, get more for your money. Get police car performance from the Rio Grande Cracked gasoline dealer in your neighborhood. And now it is our pleasure to present Captain W.C. Allen of the Los Angeles Missing Persons Detail. Captain Allen. Good evening, friends. The case about which you will hear tonight is an amazing example of the investigation work of an untrained private individual and indicates what really fine work can be accomplished by a citizen when he or she is sufficiently aroused to action. In this case, it was a mother's love that prompted the discovery of clues leading to the apprehension of the murderer. And if every citizen felt a love for his fellow man, a love so great that he would seek to aid the police in solving crimes, not only would the crime rate diminish, but the result of the practical application of such an emotion would be the disappearance of crime altogether. On a little farm in the great central valley of Oregon a few years ago, a fond mother is busily preparing her son for a journey. There, now, there's sock, mm -hmm. shirt, yeah. toothbrush. Uh -huh. I guess that's about everything. <laughs> yeah. Gee, Mother, it, it sure was nice of you to get me those things brand new. Well, you'll want good, durable clothes when you get to oh, Los Angeles. It's, it's getting late. I've got to get started. Now, wait a minute. I almost forgot. Now, these have to go in the bag. Blankets? Oh, Mother, what the devil do I need with blankets in Los Angeles? Well, you never can tell what the weather'll be, Dale, and I don't want you to catch Mother, cold. Mother, it's down in Los Angeles. Oh, don't you believe all you read about the warm sun, the palm trees. I hear the nights down there can be downright chilly. <laughs> there. 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 Now you're all packed. All right. I've got to get going. Well, goodbye, son. Goodbye, Mother. I'll, I'll send for you. Just as soon as I can get a job. And don't you forget to write to me every day, will you? Don't worry, darling, I won't. Goodbye. Goodbye, son. So Dale Slater, carpenter's helper, sets out for a new life in the Southland. True to his promise, he writes his mother every day. But the opportunities in Los Angeles at that time were not all the young man had expected. On June 15, 1931, he writes his mother... Employment is scarce here. I'm going to Boulder City on June 16th. A man who knows several of the foremen over there is going along with me. He says he can get jobs for both of us. After that, silence. Day follows letterless day. Frantic with fear, Mrs. Slater asks Cecil Dell, her son-in-law, who lives in Los Angeles, to try to find Dale. Inquiries to the Boulder City and Las Vegas police are fruitless. No one has seen or heard of young Slater. At last, Mrs. Slater writes the Motor Vehicle Bureau in Sacramento for information regarding her son's car. Back comes the answer. In reply to your request for information regarding a 1929 Ford Coupe, Oregon license number 725649, we beg to inform you that the registration of this automobile was transferred to one Gilbert F. Colley of Los Angeles on June 27th. The records are incomplete, and at this time, we are unable to give you Mr. Colley's address. Hoping this serves your purpose, we beg. 
Convinced that her son has met with harm, Mrs. Slater travels to Los Angeles determined to find the mysterious Mr. Colley. Her son-in-law has little encouragement for her. I've tracked down every angle I can think of, Mother, and I, I just can't get a line on this Collie man. Well, Dale told me he was going to Boulder City with some man. I'm sure that man was Collie. Well, the Boulder City and Las Vegas police haven't seen either of them. I wrote you that. Yes, I know. Well, how about the Los Angeles police? I've been to see Captain Allen of the missing person detail. He's keeping a lookout for Dale, but he told me not to worry. Most missing persons are just people who get tired of riding home. Oh, but Dale always rode every day. Oh, still, I wouldn't be too worried, Mother. After all, he's young and he's never been away from home before. Maybe he's tied up with some girl who's taking up all his time. Oh, Dale isn't that kind of a boy. You'd be surprised how many boys are, Mother. Oh, well, I know my son better than you do, and I'm sure something's happened to him or he would have written to me. Now, I want you to go to Las Vegas and Boulder City and inquire for him yourself. But, Mother, I haven't any money. Well, I have. I drew every penny of my savings out of the bank before I left. Very well. If you want to pay the freight, I'll go. But Dell's trip to Nevada is fruitless. No one has seen or heard of Slater or Collie. However, on the way back, Dell does run into a clue at the border checking station at Yuma. Yes, I remember that car with the Oregon license. I had some trouble about it. What kind of trouble? Oh, there was a question about the identity of the driver. Uh, wait a minute till I look at the book. Oh, yeah, here it is. 1929 Ford Coupe, Oregon license number 725-649, owned by Dale Slater. That's it. Well, it crossed the line June 19th. The day after Dale and this fellow Collie left for the dam. What did the driver look like? Well, as I remember it, he was, oh, a heavy middle-aged fellow, about 50, had heavy cheeks. Kind of a tough guy. Was there a younger man in the car? No, he, he was all alone. So that's all I could find out, Mother. It isn't much of a lead. Dale left here with someone on the 18th of June. On the 19th of June, somebody drove his car out of the state. And on the 27th of June, a man named Collie registered the car in his own name. Oh, I know something's happened to him. Well, I don't know how you're going to find out. Well, couldn't we get some more help from the Motor Vehicle Bureau in Sacramento? I don't know. Maybe they might be able to give you a line on this Collie's address. Well, I won't be satisfied until I'm sure that Dale sold that car... It just wouldn't be like him to do that without telling me. Well, they could send you a photostatic copy of the transfer card. If you'll pay for it, I got one well, once. Well, I'll pay for it. I'll pay for anything for word for my boy. Within a few days, the reply comes from Sacramento. Well, they, they found an address for this Mr. Colley. Where? Well, they think he can be located in Las Vegas. Well, they're crazy. I tell you, nobody up there ever heard of him. Did you send a copy of the transfer card? Yes, here it is. Why, look. What? This isn't Dale's handwriting, this signature. No, by golly, you're right. Oh, what do you suppose has happened to him? Now, Mother, get a hold well, of yourself. This is no time to break up. Why? We've got to figure out what to do next. Well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a letter to this Mr. Collie in Las Vegas. But Mother, that's useless. Well... Contrary to her son-in-law's hopeless attitude, Mrs. Slater's letter does bring a reply from Collie. A reply which sends her with something concrete into the office of Captain Allen of the Missing Persons Bureau. And then today I got this letter from the man. He says here that Dale went broke in Boulder City and sold him the car. He says Dale couldn't get a job because he drank too much. Oh, that isn't true, Captain. My son never drank. This man's lying. Now, now, well, Mrs. I... Slater, take it well, easy. Well, I can't help it. I haven't drawn a peaceful breath for a month. I just know something awful's happened to him. You've got to find this man and make him tell. Have you any idea where we can find him? Well, I sent the letter to Las Vegas, but the reply was mailed in Los Angeles, and it had a Los Angeles return address on it. Here it is on the envelope. I see. Well, Mrs. Slater, we'll send a couple of men around there to see if we can locate Mr. Colley. Yes, and I'm going with them. I want to talk to that man. If he's done anything to my boy. <laughs> Captain Allen assigns Detective Lieutenants Eddie Romero and W.J. Clark to accompany Mrs. Slater. Arriving at the address on East 3rd Street, a cheap rooming house, they are informed by the landlady that Mr. Colley no longer lives there. However, they insist upon examining his room. Didn't leave much behind him. Some stuff here in the closet, Eddie. What is it? Oh, some shirts stuffed up here on the shelf. Let me see them. Yeah, here you are, ma'am. 
Recognize him, ma'am? Why, well, I think that... Say, uh, that say, was... here's a suitcase back here. A suitcase? Yeah, yeah, look. That's his. That's Dale's suitcase. I packed it for him. Open it up. Hurry, open it up. Yes, yes, there's the socks I got him and the blankets. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, terrible. Now, wait a minute, ma'am. Nothing's terrible yet. Oh, I'm sure something's happened to Dale. Oh, I'll never be sure about anything, <laughs> oh, ma'am. I'll bet any dough he's okay. Oh, no, something awful's happened to him. We've got to find this guy, Collie, first. All we know is he's got your son's car and his clothes, but that doesn't prove your son's oh, in any no. trouble. I'm positive. I'm positive. While Detective Clark seeks to calm the hysterical Mrs. Slater, Romero interviews the landlady. Do you have any idea where Mr. Collie's gone? No, I haven't. It's very important that we get in touch with him. What do you want him for? We think he can give us some information. Did you ever hear him mention a young fellow by the name of Slater? No, I haven't. Well, this boy's missing, and we're trying to locate him. He was last seen with Collie. Oh, then you aren't trying to pin anything on him. Oh, I should say not. We just want to talk to him. Please, that poor woman's mind about her son. Now, tell me where he is, huh? Oh, I, I really don't know. He doesn't always stay here when he comes to town. But uh, he does phone me whenever he's here. He does? Yes. You see, uh, we're good friends. Will you let us know when he comes in town again? Why, certainly. I'm sure he'll be glad to help you, if he can. Thanks. Uh, here's my card. You just call me at Michigan 5211, the first thing you hear from, huh? But the two officers do not sit idly by, waiting for Collie to return to Los Angeles. Equipped with a photograph of the missing boy, they set out on the highway between Los Angeles and Las Vegas to interview every gasoline station and hamburger stand attendant in an effort to discover a trace of him. It is a grueling, hopeless work. But finally, at a station in the desert between Victorville and Barstow... Oh, sure. Sure, I remember that, lad. I stopped by here to fix some wiring in his car. What kind of a car was it? It seems like... Ford Coop. Was he alone? Uh, no, 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 there was another guy with him. No, no sound as he was. He never opened his trap. Never got out of the car. Let the kid do the work. And what this other man look like? Well, about 50, I guess. Uh, heavy set fellow. Well, thanks a lot, partner. Come on, Clark. Uh, sure thing. Drop in again when you need some more gas. Hey, what's the idea of heading back? We're going to San Bernardino. Why? Well, look. Slater and this heavy set guy were together at that service station. And when the car got to Yuma... The heavy fellow was alone. Something happened to Slater between that gas station and Yuma. Yeah, that check's all right, but why go back? Why not go on and search the country between here and Yuma? Because that whole stretch of highway lies in San Bernardino County. I want the cooperation of Sheriff Shea down in San Bernardino before we get started on that job. Sheriff Emmett Shea of San Bernardino County gives the Los Angeles officers full cooperation. From the sheriff's office goes a statewide bulletin carrying Slater's picture and asking for information regarding his whereabouts and for the arrest of Gilbert Colley in connection with the disappearance. Within a couple of days, the replies begin coming in. Orange County reports... Gilbert Colley wanted in Orange County for jumping bond and a theft charge. From Northern California comes the information that Colley has previously been arrested for theft there. And from the State Bureau of Identification at Sacramento comes the greatest assistance. In reply to your bulletin, Gilbert Francis Colley has a long criminal record. He is known under seven aliases and is a very tough subject. Fingerprints and photographs are enclosed. And while Clark and Romero are still jubilant over the information they now have on their man... Detective Bureau, Clark speaking. May I speak with Lieutenant Romero, please? Yeah, just a moment. For you, Eddie. Okay, thanks. Romero speaking. Lieutenant Romero, this is Mrs. Stein. Mrs. Stein? Yeah, that's the landlady over at Collie's place. Oh, yes, yes, Mrs. Stein. Uh, well, what is it? He's back. Who, Collie? Yes, he phoned me this morning. He isn't staying at your place? No, he's down at a Japanese rooming house on North Main Street, 729. Well, thanks a lot, Mrs. Stein. We'll go down there and have a little talk with him. Oh, so very sorry. Uh, Mr. Cully, not a living here anymore. When did he leave? Oh, he leaving this morning. Where'd he go? Oh, he not, uh, he say he go with Mr. Walker to Imperial Valley for looking for work. Yes. Uh, who's Walker? Oh, he being uh, other rumor. Uh, not knowing how I living with the rumors are moving all the time. 
And the owing me money, what is a for them boy? Hello, Jim Money Walker. Oh, no, 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 not a walker, but uh, Mr. Kelly. He owing money. Oh. He's saying uh, he pay back, but I don't know, maybe so. Okay. You know who we are? Oh, I'm thinking you're a policeman. Well, that's right. We want to talk to Kelly. Now, you let us know when he comes back. See? Oh, yes, sir. I sing very well, thank you. And uh, don't tell him that we were here. Get it? Oh, I'm getting it. Uh, not a telling, but uh, seeing. Yes, sir. But in spite of the Japanese proprietor's voluble promises, Romero and Clark place a stakeout on the rooming house. For three days, officers watch the spot day and night. And finally, at midnight of November 20th, Collie returns to the place. A few moments later, Romero and Clark interview the landlord. Yes, uh, Mr. Collie, he's coming back. And, oh, joy, he paying me five dollars he owe. He having a much of money this time. Flash to roll, did he? Oh, yes, sir. But uh, too bad. Uh, Mr. Walker, he not uh, coming back. He gone for keeps, Mr. Collie, say. Well, let's, uh, let's have the key to his room. Oh, rooms in my place are not having keys. Uh, more better no monkey business in the rooms if door cannot be locked. So much the better. What room's he in? Uh, number 112. Uh, uh, that is uh, three doors down hall to right. Uh, Come on, Clark. We are. Boy, is he sawing wood. We'll just ease in on him. You all set? Let's go. Flash your light around. Ought to be a switch by the door. Yeah, yeah, here it is. <laughs> the light didn't even wake him. Okay. Okay, Carly, snap out of it. Uh-huh. Come on, come on, wake up. Who are you guys? Police officers. Where's your friend, Walker? Yeah, Walker? What do you want him for? Plenty. Where is he? I uh, left him down the Imperial Valley, El Centro. How did you get back? In a bus. You're lying, Collie. You drove a car. How do you know? We saw you drive in. We checked the car you were driving. It's Walker's car. Now, shag into your clothes. We're taking you in. Still letting Collie believe they're after Walker, the officers take him into Central Police Station for questioning. Look here, boys, I don't know what the big excitement is, but I'll do everything I can for you. Well, that's right accommodating of you, Collie. You can begin by telling us the truth about Walker. I've been telling you the truth. I left him down at El Centro. And how come you drove his car back here? Can't think up a comeback for that one, eh? How about Slater? Slater? Sure, Slater, your good pal, the kid you were going to find work for in Las Vegas. Uh, I don't know what you... Now, stop this fooling around, Collie. You know Dale Slater? Well... Yeah. Well, where is he? Well, I left him in Boulder City. Oh, you left him in Boulder City. And you drove his car to Yuma. Hey, you seem to be in the habit of parking your friends all over the Southwest and then driving over their car. Want to transfer Walker's car to your name like you did Slater's? I bought that car from Slater for a hundred bucks. And uh, what did you do with it? Sold it. Yeah, for a hundred and fifty, probably. Where's Slater? In Boulder City when I saw him last. Where's Walker? In El Centro. We got a bond jump charge against you in Orange County, Collie. You might as well come clean. I'm telling the truth. Uh, take him to his cell, Clark. I'm going to ring Sheriff Jackson in Orange County and tell him we got his man. But Romero is unable to get in touch with Sheriff Jackson. For at that moment, he is investigating the charred remains of a burned barn at the town of Olinda and listening to the report of two men who fought the fire. Uh, we were coming out from work in the oil fields, uh, Bowman and I, and we saw this barn burning, so we tried to put it out, but we couldn't. It was burning too old. Well, what'd you call me for? Uh, look what we found in the ashes. Throw your light down there, Bowman. Now, uh, there, Sheriff. A burned human body. Well, that's what we thought, so we called you. Did you find any identification on him? We didn't look very carefully, but you can see one arm isn't burned, and there's a straight eagle tattoo on it. But do either of you know anybody with such a tattoo? No, sir. Well, it's probably some tramp crawled into the barn for sleep and set fire to it with a match. I'll have the coroner's ambulance pick him up. The following morning, Sheriff Jackson telephones the Los Angeles police, apologizing for being out and explains the circumstances of the tramp who was burned. Inspector Davidson, to whom he is speaking, is thinking fast along another line. Wait a minute, Sheriff. Maybe that was a tramp, and maybe it wasn't. Why, what do you mean? Well, this fellow Collie that you want on bond jumping come in last night about midnight from Imperial Valley. 
He drove in by way of Riverside. He could have come through Orange County. Could have come through Olinda. Yes, he could have, but it would have been out of his way. Worth it if he wanted to bump somebody off. What do you mean? Collie went to the Imperial Valley with a fellow by the name of George Walker. He came back alone with Walker's car. Pulled the same thing with a boy from Oregon by the name of Dell Slater. You mean this might be murder? I do, and I'd appreciate it if you'd start investigating it as such. We have a strong suspicion against this man and no case. Maybe you could provide us with the necessary evidence to convict him. I'll certainly do everything I can, Inspector. Sheriff Jackson's revived investigation results in the discovery that the caretaker of the ranch on which the fire occurred is a brother-in-law of Collie. The sheriff questions the man closely. I tell you, I ain't seen Gil for months. But he is your brother-in-law. Sure, he's my brother-in-law. I told you that. Where were you last night? I was home in bed. You're a caretaker of this ranch. How come you didn't come down to the fire? My place is over the hill from that barn. I didn't know anything about the fire until this morning. Does your brother-in-law ever come down here? Sure, sometimes. Pretty well acquainted with the ranch, is he? He knows his way around. Do you know anybody that has a blue spread eagle tattooed on his arm? No, don't. Do you know a fellow named Dale Slater? No, don't. Who's he? Friend of college. Do you know George Walker? No, and I ain't got all day to play do you know with you. I got a fence to mend. Equipped with the important information that Collie was well acquainted with the ranch on which the burned body was found, the officers renew their grilling of the suspect. For hours, they question him, demanding to know how he came in possession of Walker's car, assuring him that they know every detail of the fire in Olinda. Finally. All right, all right. Let up, will you? Put away the saps. I killed him. He's dead. I killed him. It was him or me. He was coming for me and... I let him have it first. I carried his body to that barn down on the ranch where my brother-in-law's caretaker. I piled straw and stuff around it and poured on gasoline, lit a match. So what? Oh, so self-defense is going to be your argument. It's the truth. Not robbery? What do you mean? Oh, the car, the bankroll you flashed at the hotel last night. Oh, you dicks make me sick with your suspicion. How about Slater? Where did you murder him? Uh, what? You heard the question. What part of the highway between Phelps and Davidson's gas station and Yuma did you kill Dale Slater? Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You birds can't tie every bump off in the past ten years on me. I killed Walker in self-defense, but I ain't confessing to anything else. And I'll see you guys roast before I do. But the police are relentless. Working in relays, they continue to question the surly suspect. Midnight comes and goes. The small hours of morning are very thin and long, and day begins to open his gray eye, and still Collie is defiant. Suddenly, though... Oh, crime and you guys are gluttons for punishment. You must be almost as tired as I am. Yeah, just about. Well, let's all get some sleep, huh? As soon as you break. I ain't breaking, but I'll talk. Well, that's swell. Start right now. Okay. I killed the Slater kid. I cracked him a couple with a tent pole while he was sleeping. Where was this? You know where... Between Victorville and Yuma. We was camping out. He thought I was taking him to Boulder Dam to find a job. <laughs> Dumb lug. What did you do with the body? I burned it, like I did walkers. Only parts of Slater didn't burn so good. So I buried him. What did you do it for? I needed a car. And the kid had one. You think you could find that spot where you killed him? Yeah. I know where it is. Okay, let's go. Uh-uh. Not me. What do you mean, uh-uh, not hey, you? Hey, listen... I don't want to see no more dead men. Now I told you all about it. I confessed everything, so just count me out of this picnic. I'll draw you a map, but I, I don't want to go near the place. I'm sick of dead bodies. The officers, following the self-confessed murderer's map, easily discover the charred remains of Dale Slater. And after further investigation of his effects, they talk to Collie once more. So you found the kid, eh? That's good. When I get around to it, I'll give you a line on some more bodies. I'll keep you digging for a long time. What do you mean? Don't you wish you knew? You're not referring to these, are you, Collie? And where'd you get them keys? Out of a suitcase of yours. The keys to 20 ignition locks on 20 automobiles. Where did you get them? 
try and find out. Who else did you bump off for his automobile, Collie? Don't you wish you knew? No amount of questioning can elicit further information from Collar regarding his murder career. But officers uncover strange tales. From the landlady on 3rd Street, they learn... Mr. Collie left for Sequoia on August 10th, 1931, with a boarder of mine by the name of J.F. Halligan. Mr. Halligan never returned. A young man reports... My father was supposed to join Collie at Boulder Dam on June 22nd. He left for the dam, but I haven't seen him since. Riverside County Authorities report. Holly lived next door to a Barney Woods in Riverside several years ago. Woods disappeared in 1923. Six years later, they dug up his skeleton in his own backyard. But nothing more was proven, nor did it have to be proven. Collie was tried for the killing of Slater and found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to hang. In condemned row, Collie went insane and was removed to the state hospital at Mendocino, where he quickly regained his sanity. Upon his return to San Quentin to be hanged, Governor Rolfe commuted his sentence to life imprisonment. Thank you, Captain Allen. Ladies and gentlemen, these true crime stories are just as interesting to read as to hear. So we invite you to call at any Rio Grande station for a free copy of the Calling All Cars News which contains these dramatic stories, illustrated descriptions of forthcoming broadcasts, and latest movie and radio news. We offer the news free, and we also offer 14 free gifts for boys and girls at service stations where Rio Grande Cracked gasoline is sold. Sooner or later, we know you'll try Rio Grande Cracked in your car, and we know that once you've experienced the thrill of police car performance in your own car, you'll never be content with any other gasoline. We also hope to win you over to Sinclair Motor Oils, which are featured by all Rio Grande stations because they are motor oils we can guarantee. We know that you can't break the lubrication seal of Sinclair Motor Oil no matter how fast you travel or how hot your engine gets. We know that other oils do break down under the strain of today's fast driving, allowing metal to scrape against metal and run up repair bills for you. Because the users of Rio Grande cracked gasoline want greater speed and power... We urge them all to protect their engines with Sinclair motor oils so they can enjoy greater speed with safety. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 146 regarding a missing person. This subject has been found murdered. That's all. Rose and Quiz. Your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. Copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars. Broadcast 147, a murder in the Viduga Hills outside Glendale. That's all. Rose and Quiz. people who listen to Calling All Cars would suddenly decide to try Rio Grande cracked gasoline, every Rio Grande service station tank would be dry in a few hours. Every week we appeal to all of you to drive into a Rio Grande station, and after every broadcast, hundreds accept our invitation. You look for the big Rio Grande sign. 
You see the slogan, calling all cars, cracked gasoline, and you drive in. If you've followed our broadcasts carefully, you ask for a free copy of the Calling All Cars News and look for the illustrations of the 14 free gifts Rio Grande offers to boys and girls. Then you say skeptically to the attendant, well, fill her up with Rio Grande cracked. I've heard so much about it, I want to see how it's true. So you get a tank full and you get a handful of police money with your change, police money that youngsters are eagerly saving to exchange for Rio Grande's free gifts. And you start down the street expecting great things to happen. Ah, but nothing does. Well, remember, you've got at least a gallon or so of some other gasoline to use up. Perhaps you won't notice the difference until next morning when you step on the starter and find your engine roaring before you can get your foot off the button. You never had starts like that with any other gasoline. Get into second gear, speed up, and you can't help but notice how much peppier your car acts. How easily you pass other cars in traffic and speed ahead after traffic stops. Look for a hill. Go up it in high gear. You'll agree then that Rio Grande Crack makes all the difference in the world in your car, and you'll realize then what we mean when we offer you police car performance in your car. Now it is our pleasure to present Sheriff Eugene Biscalouse of Los Angeles County. Sheriff Biscalouse. Good evening, friends. If an individual contemplating a crime, no matter for what motive, greed or revenge or whatever, could know what is common knowledge to every law enforcement officer, we would have no crime problem. The lawbreaker in his ego thinks he can pit his intelligence against the combined criminal experience of a host of officers. Such a man hasn't enough intelligence. If he had, he wouldn't try to get away with it. Even the most daring gambler would hesitate to play against the odds which confront the lawbreaker. It is my hope, and I am sure the hope of other participating officers, that this radio broadcast is in some measure, during the nearly three years it has been on the air, serve to convince the public of the futility of crime. You can't continue to get away with it. It is June 21st, 1913. Spring has come late. And the wildflowers are still blooming in the green Verdugo Hills of Love Glendale. Along a deserted path which branches up into the hills from the end of the car line, walk a carpenter and a woman companion seeking the late blooming poppies in Larkspur. Oh, John, it's so lovely up here. It sure is pretty. Look at that patch of poppies down there by that pool. Gosh, just like a golden carpet. Let's go down there. All right. Only Sarah... Will you kiss me first? Now, John, don't be silly. Now, Sarah. Listen, what's that? Sounds like somebody moaning. It came from in those bushes there. I'll take a look. It's a woman, all covered with blood. <gasps> here, Sarah, help me pull her out of here. She, she's trying to say something. Oh, her tongue's too swollen. Her throat's cut. How horrible. Listen, Sarah, we got to get her to a doctor quick. Oh, we can't carry her. No, but I have it. I'll go down the trail to the nearest phone. You stay here with her. What will I do? I'm, I'm frightened. Now, don't go to pieces. Get her some water. See if she'll drink. Oh, John, don't leave me. I've got to. You take care of her. I'll be back just as soon as I can. Deputy sheriffs arrive at the scene almost as quickly as the doctor, who has grave news for them. Well, doctor, what is it? Yeah, it's bad, Sweezy. She was dead when I got here. But she was alive when you found her. Yes, sir. She was moaning, trying to tell us something. She died a few minutes after you left, John. At least she didn't moan anymore. It was terrible. Worse even than a moaning. Oh. Well, perhaps you better take the young lady out of this. That is, if you're through questioning us, we see. Sure, go ahead. Take her home. She's all upset. Thank you. Come along, Sarah. Now, what have you found, Doctor? Well, her skull has been fractured by a blunt object. Her throat's been cut. Either injury could have caused death. Another strange thing, her hair smells of beer. Smells of beer, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the answer to this one. 
Look, Sweezy, the broken half of a beer bottle and some bloody stained bits. Well, looks as though he broke the bottle over her head and then cut her throat with a jagged end. Hmm, nice fellow. Yeah. Anything else, Moody? Well, a man's footprints lead from the place where the body was found to that pool down there. Toe prints are dug in there as though he'd stooped to wash his hands. Then the tracks disappear in the brush. That fellow who found the body said something about meeting a man as he came up the trail, didn't he? Yeah. Described him as middle-aged, stockily built, and in a hurry. Mm-hmm. Well, you boys spread around the neighborhood at the foot of the trail and see if you can find anybody down there who saw this man. And, uh, Doctor, you better get the body into the morgue so we can go over the clothes for identification. <laughs> squad of deputies combed the neighborhood at the end of Brand Avenue car line. Finally succeed in discovering a woman who says... Why, yes. I saw a couple go up at the trail about two o'clock. I was sitting outside on my porch. And what did they look like, ma'am? Well, the man was short and sort of stocky and middle-aged. The woman was a little younger, fat, and her hair was going gray. They were arguing. Did you see them when they came back down the trail? No. Well, that is not the woman. Just saw the man coming back. When was that? Oh, about an hour later. Armed with this meager information, Deputy Moody reports to Deputy Sweezy at headquarters. Not much to go on. That's a fact, but it will help. What did you discover? Nothing much more. No identification on the clothing, excepting that the underwear was bought at a Los Angeles department store. There was a hole in the shirtwaist that might indicate a pin or something been torn off it. And there's a white line on the ring finger of the left hand that might indicate the victim had worn a wedding ring recently. Well, that department store label in the underwear bears out a hunch of mine. What's that? That the victim and the murderer are from Los Angeles. How do you figure that? Glendale and Pasadena are both dry. They had beer with them. They must have bought it in L.A. Well, I think you're right about that, but Los Angeles is a pretty big town. We've got a devil of a job to identify her. We'll have to get a lot of publicity from the papers. And then when people start coming in to try to identify her, we'll have a department store dummy dressed in her clothes and see if they can identify her. A good idea. We'll get the papers to spread the thing tomorrow morning. For three days, a throng of people flock through the morgue, view the mysterious body, investigate the ghoulish display of the model dressed in the dead woman's clothes, are unable to identify her. Then, on the Wednesday following the murder, the city editor of the Los Angeles Herald summons a young reporter, Jimmy Pope, now Judge Pope of the municipal court, to his desk. Tells him to go out with the deputies investigating the crime and stick with them till he gets a story. Young Pope, thrilled with the prospects of a big story, rushes out to the murder hill, joins the officers. It is a hot day, and after several hours of fruitless attempts to find something to write about, Jimmy decides to sprawl out in some tall grass and take it easy. But just as he sits down, he sees a young boy stoop over, pick up something from the ground, examine it intently. His curiosity aroused, he calls to him. Hey, young fellow, what you got there? Piece of paper. Come on over and let me look, will you? What for? Oh, I don't know. Just want to look at it, that's all. What you want to look at it for, huh? Say, you're certainly full of questions for a young one, aren't you? Come on, let's see what you've got. I won't hurt it. How much will you give me if I do? How much will I give you? Say, what is this, a racket? Will you give me a nickel? I should say not. A nickel for a piece of paper? Come on now, be a good sport and let me see it. Sure, for a nickel. No. Hey, hey, where are you going? Home. All right, Jesse James, come here. Here. Hmm? Here's a nickel for your precious piece of paper. Oh, boy. Hey, it's a brand new one, too, ain't it, huh? Sure, nothing but the best. Now give me the paper. Sure, here you are. <laughs> a bit of black paper from a Kodak film. Say, mister, what do you want that piece of paper so bad for, huh? Oh, you've got me there, young fellow. I couldn't tell you. But there's one thing certain. Now that I've paid a nickel for it, I'm sure going to hang on to it. During the rest of the long afternoon, young Pope occupies himself with one thing and another. Picks up some scraps of white paper from under a bush. Sticks them in his pocket for luck. And at last, just at sundown, the deputy sheriffs give him a ride back to town. Weary from the long day, he finds sleep impossible when he arrives home. So to keep his mind occupied, he mulls over the black Kodak paper. Examines the scraps of white paper minutely. And the next morning, he presents himself to the city editor with no story, but a meager lead to one. What'd you get out there yesterday, Jim? Well, I don't know if it's worth anything, boss, but here it is. A 
piece of black paper off a roll of film and some scraps of white paper. I fitted the scraps together and pasted them on a piece of cardboard last night, and here's the result. Seems to be a receipt. Hmm. Received of Mr. Larson, $50 deposit. Signed, S. Hickson. Have you followed up on this, Hickson? Yes, sir. I've checked with the city directory. There's an S. Hickson that runs a saloon at 112 East 1st Street. Better go right down there and see what he knows about this. And I'll send Fitzgerald over to the morgue to ask everyone who abused that body whether they know a Mr. or Mrs. Larson. While Fitzgerald races off to the morgue on the city editor's hunch, Jim Pope heads for the saloon on First Street. Good morning, sir. Good morning. What do you have? Are you Mr. Hickson, the proprietor? Yes. I've got a receipt here I found. I wonder if you could tell me who this Mr. Larson is. Uh, I don't know. You signed this receipt, didn't you? Nope. That's not your signature? Nope. You must be mistaken, young man. I don't know any Mr. Larson, and I didn't sign that slip. While Pope crushed to report his failure to the editor, Fitzgerald and the deputy sheriffs interviewed nearly 40 people who called at the morgue to view the body of the murder victim. Finally, a woman who stands looking at the clothed dummy in the outer office volunteers the first important bit of information. Some of those clothes look familiar. Do you happen to know a Mrs. Larson? Yes. What makes you ask? It might have a bearing on this case. Do you know where Mrs. Larson is now? Why, she went to San Francisco on Sunday. On Sunday? Yes, she left suddenly. Will you step in here, please? Uh, pull the sheet off this one, will you, Steve? Okay. Recognize that body, ma'am? Yes, that, that's Mrs. Larson. Sure? Yes, yes, of course. I'm positive it's her. Okay, Steve, thanks. Come this way, ma'am. Now, sit down right here, will you please? I want to ask you some questions. All right. What could have happened to her? Who did it? That's what I want to know. That's just what we're trying to find out, ma'am. Now, what's your name? Mrs. Mary Garshweiler. Address? 1129 South Olive Street. And how long have you known Mrs. Larson? Oh, yes. Where did she live? Over on West Pico. Number 12, 2 and 3 quarters. Did she live alone? No. She lived with her husband and her daughter. I see. Well, thanks, Mrs. Garshweiler. We'll get in touch with you when we need you. Acting upon the new bit of information, Deputy Sweezy and reporter Fitzgerald rushed to the Larson home on Pico Street. Not knowing exactly what to expect, the two men approached the house cautiously, ready for any surprise move the suspected Larson might make. But in response to Sweezy's knock, the door swings open. A young girl peers at them a brief instant, then slams the door shut again. Huh. That's a fine reception committee. What do you suppose made her do that? We'll find out soon enough. Maybe she thinks we're bill collectors. And then again, maybe she's been told not to open the door to strangers. Well, what do you want? Are you Miss Larson? Yes. Is your daddy here? Well, what do you want? Just want to talk to him, that's all. Well, he's not here, and I'm sorry, but I'll have to shut the door. Are you here all alone? Well, I don't see why you want to know. Better tell her who we are, Swizzy. The kid's scared of something. Seems that way, all right. Now, uh, look, miss. I'm Deputy Sheriff Sweezy, and this gentleman's a reporter. We're not going to hurt you. Just want to ask your father a few questions. Oh, well, I thought maybe... Maybe you're going to rob the house. Mommy told me not to talk to any strangers when she was away. <laughs> well, you don't have to be afraid of us, young lady. We're not here to harm anybody. You say your mother's away? Yes, sir. Daddy said she'd gone to San Francisco. Now, where is your daddy? Working? Yes, sir. I hate to have to do this, Fitz, but we need a positive identification. You mean take this kid down? Exactly. If it's her mother, she's got to know sooner or later anyway. Yeah, I suppose you're right. You're talking about my mother. Something's happened now, to Now, wait a minute, young lady. We well, didn't say that anything had happened to her. We just... You did. You did. You said I'd have to know about something anyway. Where is she? <laughs> Where is she? Where is she? even worse than I'd figured, but it's got to be done. Taken to the morgue, the sob-wracked child stands clutching Deputy Sweezy's hand, looks for one instant at the body, then runs screaming out of the dismal place. 
Identification of the murdered woman is complete. A short time later, the grief-stricken child tells the two men a tearful story. Daddy and Mother left home together last Sunday about noon. They said they were going house hunting. Late that night, Daddy came back alone. He said Mother suddenly made up her mind to go to San Francisco. He said, he said we'd follow her in a few weeks as soon as she found a house up there. And where is your daddy now? He's at work. He works in the barber shop. Well, uh, where is the barber shop? At 110 East First Street. 110 East First. <laughs> Next door to Hickson Saloon. <laughs> Having completed their investigation and gotten a scoop onto the press, reporters Fitzgerald and Pope accompanied Deputy Sweezy to the barbershop on First Street. Just have a seat, gentlemen. Just be one minute. We're looking for a man named Larson. Does he work here? Sure, that's him. Back in the last chair, he's shaving that policeman. Thanks. Murderer shaves policeman a sheriff's clothes in. What a headline, eh, Fitz? Don't be so bloodthirsty. They haven't proven a case against him yet. But they will. Uh, your name Larson? Yes. Sorry to have to bring you bad news, Larson, but your wife's been murdered. What? Yeah. Just got an identification on that Verduga Hills murder. The victim is your wife. Well, there must be some mistake. My wife's in San Francisco. I put her on the one o'clock train myself. Well, there must be some mistake. There's no mistake. Your daughter's already identified the body. You better come along with us to headquarters. We want to ask you some questions. While Barbara Larson is stepping out of his white coat, reporter Polk ducks into the saloon next door and tells bartender Hickson the developments. Now, what I want to know is, what's the big idea of the runaround? Larson is a barber next door, and it stands to reason you know him. And that receipt I showed you is signed by him. Chances are he's guilty of the murder of his wife and will be hung for it. Now, why hold out on me? Well... I tell you, son, it's my business. I make it a policy never to know too much about the other fellow's affair. And never to talk about what I do know. Well, that's a very worthy policy, but when you're handling murder, it pays to tell all you know. I haven't got anything to hide. I signed that receipt, all right. You see, Larson's foreman of the shop next door, and on Saturday nights, he's always left in charge. He brings the cash in here when he closes up to keep in my safe over Sunday. And I give him a receipt for it. Then on Monday, he returns the receipt and I give him the money, which he deposits in the bank. One night, he was in a hurry. He didn't wait for the receipt. I made it out anyway, and I put it with the money. He found it when he took the cash to the bank on Monday, and he intended to give it back to me, but he forgot about it. Later, he told me he destroyed it. So what do you think? Did he kill his wife? I don't know. He was awfully stuck on some girl that wasn't his wife, I know that. That's motive enough. Thanks for coming clean, Mr. Hickson. I'll come back someday and buy you a drink. Hope joins the officers in the barbershop and tells them for the first time about the receipt and the story he has just learned from Hickson about the other woman. The officers immediately begin to search Larson's locker. Well, here's one thing that may check. A wedding ring. Yeah, and what's that? It's one of those, uh... What do you call it, watches? Chatelaine, yeah, that's it, Chatelaine. A kind of pins to his shirtwaist. He must have ripped that off her. Remember, the doctor said the shirtwaist looked as though a pin had been torn out? Yeah. I'll bet this is what she was wearing. Yeah, and look here. A picture of a girl in a nurse's uniform. With her name written across the bottom. Lulu Maud Carpenter. Huh. Not bad looking, is she, sweetie? Hey, wait a minute. What's up? Look, this roll of film here. Well, what about it? If I'm not mistaken, it fits this roll of black paper I got from the kid on the hill. My boy, you ought to be a detective. Why, I'm ashamed enough of myself as it is, being a newspaper man. While officers are searching for the mysterious Lulu, Maud Carpenter, Moody and Sweezy question Lawson. We found some things in your locker down at the barber shop we'd like to ask you about, Mr. Larson. All right, go ahead. This watch, where did you get it? I bought it years ago in San Francisco. Well, how about this ring? Well, I bought that from a peddler on Main Street. Where's your wife, Mr. Larson? I told you. I put her on the one o'clock train to San Francisco on Sunday. You viewed the corpse in the morgue? 
Yes? And you deny it's the body of your wife? Well, I can't be sure. I, I don't think it is. Mr. Larson, you know very well it is. Now, why don't you stop lying to us and make it easy on yourself? I'm not lying. I'm trying to help you. Listen, Larson. You say you put your wife on the one o'clock train to San Francisco Sunday. That's right. There is no one o'clock train that leaves for San Francisco on Sunday or any other day. You claim you bought this watch years ago? This watch belonged to your wife. Your daughter's identified it. You tore it off your wife's body after you murdered her with a beer bottle. You say you bought this wedding ring from a peddler on Main Street. Your daughter identifies it as belonging to your wife. It fits your wife's finger perfectly. You killed your wife, didn't you? You killed your wife because you were in love with Lula Maud Carpenter, didn't you? Well? I have nothing to say. In the face of Larson's bland refusal to talk, the investigation grinds on. Little bit by little bit, the evidence piles against Larson. A conductor on the Glendale line of the Pacific Electric says... Yes, I saw this man on Sunday. He got on my car about one o'clock down at six in Maine and rode to the end of the line. He carried a bundle that might have contained bottles of beer. And from a bartender across the street, from the barbershop on First Street... Yes, I know, Larson. I sold him two bottles of beer on Saturday night. Then the word comes that the officers have located Miss Carpenter and are bringing her in. While Moody and Sweezy are waiting for her, the developed roll of film is delivered to them. Well, let's see what Mr. Larson's been photographing. Hmm. Pictures of our friend Miss Carpenter. Would you look here, Moody? These pictures were taken by that pool up in the hill. Sure, that's where young Pope got that black paper. Yeah. But can you imagine a fellow like that? Takes his girl up in the hills one weekend and comes back the next weekend and murders his wife in the same spot? <laughs> he likes the place. Maybe he'll buy a lot up there. Boys, we've got Miss Carpenter outside, sir. Send her in. Yes, sir. Will you come in, miss? Thank you. Uh, sit down, please, Miss Carpenter. Thank you. I'm Deputy Sheriff Sweezy. This is Deputy Sheriff Moody. How do you do? Uh, Miss Carpenter, are you acquainted with Mr. Larson? Why, yes. The officers told me what you suspect him of. I, I just can't believe it. He was always so kind and, and good to me. Mm -hmm. Do you mind telling us, ma'am, all you know about him? Well, I first met him last December when he came to my aunt's house to inquire about some real estate she was selling. He posed as a wealthy investor. Said he was single and lived at a downtown hotel. We became good friends after a while. He was very religious. Every Sunday, we went to church together. Do you recognize these pictures, Miss Carpenter? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, of course. They were taken by Mr. Larson when we went to pick wildflowers. Oh, uh, when was that? Two weeks ago, last Sunday. And last Sunday, he took his wife to the same place where these pictures were taken and beat her over the head with a beer bottle. Oh, please don't. Uh, did you notice Mr. Larson throw anything away while you were up there with him... Uh, uh, any piece of paper, that is? Why, yes, I did. He put his hand in his pocket for something or other and took out a piece of paper instead. He didn't seem to want me to see it, so he crumpled it up and threw it away. I shouldn't think he'd want you to see it. Here it is. A receipt for Saturday's take at the barber shop. He wouldn't want to admit that to you when he was posing as a rich real estate operator. No. No, I can see that now. Now, uh, when did you see him last? On Sunday evening. Just after he murdered his wife? Oh, yeah. Yes, I guess so. Uh, what did you do that night? Well, I met him about six o'clock at the P.E. station at 6th and Main. We had dinner at a cafeteria, and then we went to church. After services, we had a dish of ice cream, and then he took me to the hospital where I was due on duty at 10 o'clock. Did he act nervous or upset? Yes, he did. He was very strange. He kissed me good night, but well, not in the way he usually did. I said I was afraid he didn't love me anymore, and he made a strange remark. I, I guess I'm just beginning to understand it. What did he say? He said, I think enough of you to make it possible for you to be my wife. This 
damning statement, the evidence assembled by the officers and the two newspaper reporters, need only a second and even more damning statement to convict Larson of the murder of his wife. That statement is made by Larson's daughter on the witness stand. My mother told me once that if anything ever happened that she was hurt or killed, I mustn't let my father go free. Larson could bring no defense to sway a jury away from the evidence of his guilt, furnished by Deputy Sheriffs Moody and Sweezy and reporters Jimmy Pope and Fitzgerald. He was found guilty of murder in the first degree and in due time was hanged in San Quentin Penitentiary. Thank you, Sheriff Fiskaloos. Sheriffs and police chiefs of California, Arizona, and Nevada unanimously agree that calling all cars helps prevent crime and that Rio Grande cracked gasoline helps catch criminals. Sheriffs of many western counties specify Rio Grande cracked, as do the police chiefs of Los Angeles, Oakland, and other leading western cities. These men give gasoline its supreme test, and they know that Rio Grande cracked starts quicker, goes faster, and further. As a result of the recommendation, Rio Grande cracked gasoline powers more police and emergency cars than any other brand everywhere it is sold. You can get this same gasoline in your neighborhood, Rio Grande Station. But if you are going to enjoy police car performance in your own car, first protect your engine with Sinclair motor oil. Many oils break down at high speed. Many oils fail to lubricate fast starting engines. But we guarantee that Sinclair motor oil will never fail to give your engine perfect lubrication. The impurities have been extracted, the wax, the petroleum jelly that weakens motor oils, leaving only pure, concentrated oil. Every Rio Grande dealer recommends and guarantees Sinclair motor oil. Cars, attention all cars, attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars, a cancellation broadcast 147 regarding a murder. The Spectrum's case now in custody. That's all. Roll and quit. Frederick Lindsley bidding you